past 25 years. During this time, we have developed and implemented numerous good government accountability initiatives. Uh, please see Exhibit A. I'm privileged to serve as a resource witness on H.R. 2142. This morning, I would like to touch upon three of the good government accountability initiatives that were developed and implemented during the 1990s, namely statewide strategic planning, performance budgeting, and performance monitoring. These initiatives are the foundation of our fiscal accountability system, a system that Representative Cuellar, a sponsor of H.R. 2142, championed in Texas throughout the 1990s. In 1991, Texas faced a ma massive budget deficit to engender support for a tax bill and in response to a growing sense of frustration on the part of the legislature and the public as to what are we getting for our money, three interdependent initiatives were subsequently enacted, strategic planning, performance budgeting, and performance monitoring. Please see Exhibit B. The strategic planning process requires state agencies to identify the goals and strategies and performance measures that constitute the basis for their biennial request for appropriations. The strategic planning process is a long-term, iterative, and future-oriented process of assessment, goal-setting, and decision-making. An agency's strategic plan is used as a starting point for developing the budget agency's budget structure, i.e. goals, strategies, measures, measure definitions, and items of appropriation. Please see Exhibit C. The development of performance budgets occurred during the legislative appropriations process. Performance measures, definitions, and targets are established for each item of appropriation, and each item, each agency develops a budget structure that includes its performance measures and definitions and targets. Please see Exhibit D for an example. Once the state budget is enacted, performance monitoring involves each agency reporting to the Legislative Budget Board electronically every quarter on their success in achieving agency-specific performance targets. To ensure the integrity of the performance information that is being reported, measure certification audits are conducted by the State Auditor's Office on an ongoing basis. Assessments of how well agencies are able to achieve their uh, performance targets provide essential information for the next iteration of the biennial appropriations and strategic planning process. After more than 15 years of daily use, we have learned many important lessons about our fiscal accountability system. For example, our system enables legislatures, legislators and citizens alike to one, understand what we are getting for our money, two, assess agency and program performance, and three, improve and ensure greater governmental accountability and transparency. That said, the system cannot and should not be used to abdicate the hard policy, budget, and political decisions that we as public servants have an obligation to make in the best interest of the public and the taxpayer. I should note that Texas's fiscal accountability system is the foremost system of its type in the United States. During the past 15 years, 28 delegations of foreign government officials representing 38 countries have traveled to Austin to learn how Texas has integrated strategic planning performance budgeting, and performance monitoring into a seamless system that promotes statewide accountability, effectiveness, and efficiency, and most importantly, extols the many virtues of budget transparency. I would be delighted to respond to any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Barton. I made a mistake. It's Burton, B-U-R-T-O-N. Got to change these glasses. <laughs> Mr. Hedinger, you may proceed, please. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, Mr. Cuellar, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I have a longer written statement which I submitted to the committee, uh, and I'd like to have that included in the, in the record, but I'll try to somewhat summarize those remarks uh, here this morning. Uh, as was previously mentioned, from 2003 to 2006, I served as staff director of this subcommittee. Uh, then known as the Subcommittee on Government Management. Can you pull your mic right up? I knew you were going to tell me that. And I'm <laughs> always a staffer at heart, yeah. and I could, yeah. I could hear it wasn't yeah. coming through correctly. We're recording this um, session. We need to hear you. Uh, uh, the, the subcommittee at that time was known as the Subcommittee on Government Management, Finance, and Accountability, then under the leadership of Todd Platts of, of Pennsylvania. As a result, I know firsthand that the work of this subcommittee is extremely important to the efficient and effective operation of the federal government. Uh, also, as was previously mentioned, I'm currently a director with Grant Thornton's Global Public Sector Practice, uh, but I'm here today as a witness based on my experience in the U.S. Congress, specifically my time 
on this subcommittee, uh, and my testimony does not necessarily reflect the views of, of Grant Thornton. Um, my testimony today is really focused on two areas of specific interest to the subcommittee, uh, government performance and budgeting generally, uh, and secondly, H.R. 2142, Mr. Cuellar's legislation uh, known as the Government Efficiency, Effectiveness, and Performance Improvement Act of 2009. Linking budgets to performance with the expectation of achieving better results is extremely important and something I know this subcommittee has spent a great deal of time focused on. When Congress passed the Government Performance and Results Act, GIPRA, in 1993, I believe it envisioned a comprehensive integration of agency annual performance plans with the annual budget process, a worthwhile goal. GIPRA also sought a more open, accountable, and transparent government. As we sit here today, 17 years after GIPRA's enactment, uh, I, can, I believe we continue to strive to achieve that vision. GIPRA did provide a sound baseline for linking budget and performance. Agency strategic plans as required under GIPRA force agencies to think strategically about the implementation of their budgets and how those budget expenditures achieve results. I believe we've seen significant improvement as a result of GPRA. Building on GIPRA and prior management improvement efforts such as President Clinton's reinventing government, the Bush administration implemented the President's management agenda to drive agencies to better performance and results. The PMA also implemented a management tool known as the Program Assessment Rating Tool, or PART. PART, uh, as, as I'm sure the committee members know, over the eight years of the Bush administration reviewed the performance of all programs 20 percent a year over a five-year period utilizing a simple questionnaire and then making that information available to the general public via results.gov. This effort, while well-intentioned, was not without controversy, both at the agency level and here in Congress, in large part due to the fact that the effort was driven by OMB as opposed to the Congress or the individual agencies. In addition, many stakeholders felt the reviews were being used for political purposes. This brings me to my discussion of Representative Cuellar's legislation, H.R. 2142, the Government Efficiency, Effectiveness, and Performance Improvement Act of 2009. This legislation is very similar to legislation that Representative Platts and I developed in 2004, known as the Program Assessment and Results Act, or PAR Act, reported out of this committee in the 108th Congress. Like Representative Cuellar's bill, this legislation sought to ensure the periodic review of government programs to measure their efficiency and effectiveness. In addition to the basic requirement of this legislation that all federal programs be reviewed at least once every five years, H.R. 2142 includes a number of other key provisions that I believe are essential should this bill move forward. These include, first, providing for advanced publication of the list of programs to be reviewed. Second, requiring the development of a process to receive stakeholder comment. Third, requiring the reporting of the results of the program assessments through the annual budget process. And lastly, requiring the development of an improvement plan to address weaknesses identified through these reviews. The bill also designates the agency performance improvement officer as the key official responsible for program assessment and review, a position I would add that did not exist when Representative Platts' legislation was introduced. I wanted to share with the committee today some of the important lessons I learned through the effort to move Representative Platts' legislation through this committee. First and foremost, let me say I believe the concept of reviewing federal programs for effectiveness on a regular basis is a good idea. It is only through this type of effort that we are able to determine if the programs are achieving the results we desire. As you consider H.R. 2142, I encourage you to look to the following issues that were raised by various stakeholders during consideration of Representative Platts' legislation. Firstly, congressional intent must be an overriding consideration when determining the effectiveness of a program. In the vast majority of cases, there is a legislative underpinning to a federal program, and while that program may have changed or evolved over time, the intent of Congress when that legislation was passed or the expressed congressional intent as the program evolved must be a strong factor in determining its effectiveness. I encourage the committee when looking at this legislation to work with your counterparts on the Appropriations Committee as well as the Authorization Committees of Jurisdictions and obtain their input on the bill. Second, results reviews must be empirical, fact-based, and made without political judgment. 
Third, the metrics used to, effect, to assess the effectiveness must match the intent of the program, i.e., there must be agreement in advance on what outcome the program was intended to achieve, and it must be judged against that intended outcome. Fourth, some results are subjective, and therefore it is more difficult to assess the effectiveness of certain programs than others. Fifth, any effort to review program effectiveness must be driven at the agency level rather than dictated from OMB. OMB should, however, play an active advisory role in the process. Lastly, common sense must prevail. I applaud the committee for its ongoing efforts to improve the transparency, efficiency, and effectiveness of the federal government. The more transparent our government is, the more I believe the citizens of this country will be able to trust that their hard-earned tax dollars are being used in a way that achieves results. I also applaud Representative Cuellar for his ongoing efforts to enhance the legislative debate that Chairman Platt started five years ago regarding the need to review the effectiveness of gov government programs on a recurring basis. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And now, Mr. Rushi. Good morning, Chairwoman Watson and members of the subcommittee. It is an honor to appear before you today to discuss the financial situation of the United States government. My name is Véronique de Rugy. I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, a research-based organization where I study budget and tax issue. It's in this capacity that I've studied and reported on America's fiscal situation for a number of years. As GAO has noticed, America's financial situation is unsustainable. In 2009, the federal government ran a 1.4 trillion deficit. That represents 10% of GDP, a level unseen since the Second World War. More worrisome, the CBO projects that without policy changes, we will be running annual average deficit of, a, of $1 trillion during the next 10 years. Also, as our nation's two most expensive programs, Medicare and Social Security, continues to grow. The trust funds these program of this program will run larger cash flow deficits. Over the next 75 years, the government has promised benefits for these two programs in excess of anticipated payroll tax revenues equal to $7.7 trillion and $38 trillion, respectively. The Treasury Department estimates the tax would have to rise by about one-third to pay all the promises that have been made for these two programs alone. And OMB estimates that in the absence of massive cuts in Social Security, Medicare, and other programs, or an equivalent massive tax increase, the national debt will rise to 77% of GDP in 2020, 100% of GDP in 2030, and more than twice GDP in 2050. You've heard from other witnesses about the federal government's financial situation. So I will shift gears and focus the rest of my remarks on two points. First, deficits and debt matter. And second, the accounting practices and methods used by the federal government underestimate the gravity of our situation. First, some commentator on both sides of the aisles continue to insist that deficit and debt do not matter much. It is important to understand why they are mistaken. My written testimony details six reasons why deficits and debt matter, but I will focus on three here. First, debt is expensive, and the more that we borrow, the higher the cost of borrowing. This year alone, the federal government will pay $700 billion in interest. That's the equivalent of the money we spend on two wars and the entire budget of the Defense Department. Second, large and unsustained deficit and debt cripple economic growth. Americans simply do not save enough to both lend the government everything it needs to finance persistent deficit and continue to invest in the growth of the private sector. This means that every dollar that the government borrows makes it harder for the private sector to borrow an extra dollar it needs to invest in the economy. This hinders economic growth. Third. A growing debt sends signals to investors that we are becoming risky borrowers. Over the last two years, the United States had become increasingly reliant on short-term debt, which makes sense in time of very low interest rate. 
However, in the long run, our lenders might reassess the credit risk that the government represents and start applying rates to reflate that risk, or simply might be less willing to lend us money. When that time comes, access to capital will become harder for everyone. It will be more expensive to buy a house, to fund a business, or to save for the future. To conclude on this point, running deficits can certainly be appropriate at times of particular stress, such as wars and recession. But in the long run, persistent large deficits and growing debts undermine our nation's prosperity. My final point, point deal with the way that the federal government accounts for its financial. One of the most compelling examples of this misrepresentation is seen as how the federal government accounts for IOUs in the Social Security Trust Fund. And this is on top of everything GAO has mentioned today. While the Department of Treasury's financial statement of the United States depicts the financial situation of the country much more accurately than the budget of the United States, as it uses accrual accounting rather than cash flow, it is still deceptive because it leaves out some important elements that hide our true level of debt. For instance, it does accurately represent some of the government's unfunded liability, but it also leaves out over 4.4 trillion in intra-governmental debt, 2.5 trillion of which is due to Social Security. This is a breach of trust because it fails to inform taxpayers that the same people who already contributed to the trust fund will have to, to contribute once again once the government starts repaying its debts to Social Security. The complex and confusing ways in which the federal government goes about accounting for its assets and liability does not allow policymakers and agency decision makers to make informed decisions about the nation's true fiscal position. This needs to change. I thank you again for the opportunity to testify on this important topic, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate the witnesses' input. And uh, since, uh, Mr. Crayar, we are really looking at your bill and see if uh, it addresses uh, some of the points that were made by our witnesses, I'm going to turn the questioning over to you. And uh, we only have five minutes left for the duration of this committee, and I will yield to you to use those five minutes. And let me just say to the witnesses, too, um, you need to take into consideration the United States. You need to take into consideration how we make changes and move forward. And you need to take into consideration and suggest to us how we serve. And uh, it was mentioned that um, our nation's prosperity, how do we continue to prosper under the current global conditions that are existing today. Do we raise taxes? Do we cut the safety net? What do we do? So we need your guidance. We need your input. That's the reason why we're holding these hearings. I now yield to Mr. Cuellar. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you again for, for allowing this bill to be considered today. Uh, I want to thank all the witnesses for, for being here. I thank you very much. Um, if I can just give a quick background. Go ahead. This is uh, the, the um, when we talk about results-oriented government. It is a, I think, an idea that both Democrats and Republicans can work on. If I can just give you my personal experience, back in Texas, we started in 1991 uh, with Governor Ann Richards. Um, then in 1995, 94, Governor Bush at that time, then of course President Bush, came in, and one of the concerns I had was, you have a shift from a Democrat to a Republican. Are they going to change that? And actually, what uh, Governor Bush at that time went on and, and built on, 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 on this idea of performance-based budgeting. Um, in, in between that, in 1993, I guess around that time, uh, the, uh, under Al Gore, uh, where this uh, got started on this, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of John Sharp and a team of Texans that came up here and basically uh, talked to the, um, gave advice and suggestions to, to the uh, Clinton administration. A lot of it based on what we had done in Texas. And of course, then you know, the present law that we have got built on that. Uh, then, of course, as the witness, Mr. Henninger, came in, when then Governor Bush and then President Bush came in, he then started building up on what was done by President Clinton. So it's an idea that I think uh, serves both, uh, does, doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, uh, 
um, uh, on this particular issue. Well, uh, we're let me just uh, interrupt you here. Uh, we were left with a sizable surplus after the Clinton administration, so that's something that he picked up, right. I think, during that time. And now, in the last eight years, we went down like this. Uh, I would hope that in these hearings, we would try to put our finger, and I understand what you're trying to do, and I quizzed my staff this morning as to what was the real intent. And as we look at performance base, we're looking at the efficacy of our policies, what works and what doesn't, so that we can dig ourselves out. It'll be, I think, decades before we dig ourselves out and reduce right, exactly. the deficit. And, and, and we have to find a, the right thing. Another piece of legislation that got passed already, PAYGO, uh, PAYGO was in place. PAYGO got expired. That letter expired in 2003. Two wars got started. Part D Medicare came in with put in a credit card, uh, and then we saw what happened to surplus and all that. Uh, that's the PAYGO part of it. Today I'm talking about results-oriented government, which basically means if you put one dollar in, you want to know what you get for that dollar. And, and this is the the effort of this. Uh, as you know, under the Blue Dog Coalition, this is one of the 15 measures that, uh, that, uh, that that coalition is pushing. In fact, some of the members that were here a while ago are all co-sponsored of this legislation. The effort of this is just basically we want to know if we put in one dollar, what are we getting for the, this dollar? I know that when I serve in the budget committee uh, with Chairman uh, Spratt, you know, we asked some of the agencies, do we really know what we're getting out of this? And, and the experts came in and told us at that time was, no, we don't. We really don't know what we're doing and uh, a lot of the efforts that we're doing. Uh, basically, if I can just show you, if I can just show you uh, what we're trying to do, if, if we can move the uh, performance-based budgeting, basically what gets measured gets done. If we don't know how we're spending our dollars, then we certainly have a problem with that. Uh, moving on, let me give you a bill pattern, and I think this is very important. As an example, in Texas, in the 1970s, early 70s, we basically have line items. This is a light item, uh, and basically you can see even, uh, even in the budget you had seasonal help. It was just line items. We're spending this money here, this and this. Then we moved into the, um, uh, the next one, into the 1980s, and you go more into program spending. If you look at our budget right now, Madam Chair, uh, we, we basically in the, in the U.S. Congress have a program type of spending combined with a line item also uh, on that. If you look into the 1990s, and I think, uh, uh, Mr. Barton, in your testimony, you had something that went a little bit more into, uh, I think it's a little bit more up there than what I have here, but then you go into measures. You know, if you put in $1,000, what do you get for the $1,000? Uh, and, and this is what we're trying to get the federal government, because I think the, our federal government's budget is still stuck in the almost 1970s, 1980s type of uh, budgeting part of it. Uh, my question, uh, Madam Chair and, and Mr. Barron, if you can address this, in the early 1990s, Texas was also in a, in, in a uh, deficit, uh, very severe type of situation, so we had come in. Uh, we're facing the same type of situation, and I think we're in a perfect time, Madam Chair, is to say if we're concerned about spending, we're concerned about how we spend the money, are we getting the best bang for the dollar, what do we need to do? And, and I'll ask Mr. Barton and Mr. Henninger because, uh, as you know, uh, both of y'all under Mr. Platt uh, had similar legislation. We added some changes, of course, but I want to see if y'all can address in a def deficit type of situation, how can this bill help? In 1991, we had a $6 billion budget deficit. The leadership wanted to uh, pass a $3 billion tax bill and directed the Legislative Budget Board and the Texas Performance Review to come up with $3 billion in cost savings. That review process took five months, involved 120 staff from not only state government but the private sector, and we were able to produce $3 billion in savings. One of the fundamental questions we ask ourselves is whether or not various state programs were worthwhile. We talk a lot about efficiency and effectiveness, but we often don't talk about whether or not the program is worthwhile to begin with. That was one of the questions we asked ourselves in 1991. Subsequent to 1991, we incorporated these 
review processes on an ongoing basis. In Texas, we have a Sunset Commission that reviews every agency top to bottom one, once every 12 years. That was in 1991. That, that was just so everybody understand. It was under Democratic Governor and Redford, democratically controlled state mm -hmm. Senate and House uh, members uh, on that. So mm -hmm. before Bush comes in in 95. Go ahead, 1991, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, so we have a uh, once every 12 year sunset review process that reauthorizes state agencies and looks at whether or not programs are worthwhile, agencies are worthwhile, as well as whether or not they're efficient and effective. We also have a ongoing biennial review of uh, various state programs. Uh, the Legislative Budget Board produces on a biennial basis between 70 and 100 separate reports on uh, any number of the state's 2,000 programs that, that receive state appropriations. And then in addition, we do have a process that involves the state auditor's office looking at the financial uh, accountability aspects of agency expenditures. All told, I think we, we have a fairly robust uh, system of uh, uh, fiscal accountability that allows us to not, again, only look at the efficiency and effectiveness of programs, but the question as to whether or not they're worthwhile and the extent to which we can use cost-benefit analysis in the appropriations process. Uh, just, just to uh, add a little bit to, the, to those comments and maybe spin it back to um, uh, the idea of how this actually helps us to, to manage the uh, the deficit. I think, you know, from my perspective, I mean, there, this is one piece. Um, program assessment review is one piece of, of a larger financial picture. Um, if you look at what's been done traditionally with uh, the program assessments and the recommendations that have come as a part of the budget as a result of those program assessments, um, I would venture a guess to say that 75 to 80 percent of the recommended cuts based on the, the whether they be part reviews or other program assessments Congress has chosen to fund uh, and so that's an issue that you need to look at I, I had in my broader statement a discussion of sort of my thinking around the, um, the, the what I call two budget processes one being the, the process of agencies working with OMB on the development of their budget and then the second piece of that being the uh, agency work with their their appropriators to actually put funding behind those programs they're really two separate pieces and when you're talking about program assessments at least as they have traditionally been done those are done in the first part which is the agency working with OMB and that's why I think it's important as you look at this legislation that you get the buy-in from the appropriators um, and I will say, if we could have gotten buy-in four or five years ago from the appropriators, um, we probably would have been able to enact that legislation that, that Chairman Platts had introduced, B but we didn't get that buy-in. And so I think that's a really important piece that you need to look at going forward. Uh, you know, and, and we, can, we can talk here, we can, you know, I can share with some stories with you offline. I mean, we met with the appropriators, we talked a lot about this. One of the issues, and I didn't address this in my testimony, um, and I'm not sure how it's addressed in your legislation, but you know the part system as, as uh, President Bush implemented it has a score. Uh, it says that you're, you know, it says effective, ineffective, you know, results not demonstrated, et cetera. But it also gives it a score, a numeric score, 75, 80, 100, you know, whatever it may be, or in some cases a 25. And if you look at it from the perspective of the Appropriations Committee, if, if, if I fund a program that got a 25 and that's a transparent process, y you've actually put yourself in a somewhat awkward situation because um, you're essentially asking them to fund what has been termed an, an ineffective program. Again, the score is an issue that, that I think folks need to look at. Um, I'll stop with, with that. But I do think, as I said, it's one piece. Uh, it can certainly help with deficit reduction, but Congress needs to play a part in that too. Can I, can I add something? 
the Mercatus Center has done a lot of work on performance-based um, uh, management and, and transparency. And there's actually a very large economic literature on the topic. And wha the main res uh, really the main conclusion is that unless there is accountability and a bill or, or this type of uh, performance-based budgeting have real teeth in actually holding people accountable and cutting effectively cutting spending, um, it it's just not working. It's like with transparency. Transparency is cer cer 